Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm, of course, here with Michael Kester. Hey, how are you? And, uh, we're doing another fantastic episode of Double Feature today. Yeah. But we have two films on the show that probably don't go together at nope, all. Nope, not even a little. But uh, a twisted sense celebrating the macabre, I'd say. In a way. Uh, what, are, what are we doing on the show? Uh, we're doing Cemetery Man and uh, The Addams Family. All right, so probably don't watch these movies back to back. Go ahead, fucking watch them back to back. All right, that's fine. If you say watch them back to back, I'm going to follow you on that lead. We have some spoilers coming up. Yeah, on we this do. Show. So the Adams family, I'm going to say we don't have spoilers on. Oh, we kind of do. There's going to be a thing and some fester, and I don't know. Cemetery Man. We're either going to spoil it, or maybe we don't know what we're talking. Yeah, about. Yeah, I don't know if maybe you can, both. With the amount of knowledge I have on what goes on <laughs> yeah, in the film, right. I don't know if I can spoil it. That's a fine position to be in. So you can use the chapters that are embedded in this very goddamn show, and. If I remember correctly, in the lyrics section as well. Uh, why don't you go ahead and use that to skip? You know, we're going to do Cemetery Man first or Della Morte, Della More for our Italian listeners. Yeah. See, I fucking practice that shit. That's the most Italian I know right there. So if you don't want to hear me talk about Italian things, because clearly I don't know anything, but you have a lot of Italian insight, right? Yeah, You're totally. Really bring that. I have plenty to say. All right. So if you haven't seen that, which is very likely. Um, you can listen to it anyways or skip right on over where we do The Addams Family, which I believe everyone has seen. Yeah, but I think everybody needs to see it again. All right, watch it again, apparently, and then skip to that part of the show. Uh, or skip to next time. We're doing another weird thing. It's just going to get weirder and weirder <laughs> yeah. on today's show. We'll see if we can make it weirder than our ending, and we'll come back up into normal territory. Fuck, you want to jump into the weird. All right, so Cemetery Man first, then. This is a continuation of our, I guess, ongoing exploration of Italian cinema. Uh huh. This was called Cemetery Man in the U.S. Uh, got a small release in the U.S. and a weird one, too. But it is uh, Della Morte, Della More in Italy and as a, a foreign title. I think all the other countries got that. So this is kind of a play on words. It's a rhyme, obviously. Uh huh. Which Not I didn't. In a way. I didn't know at first because I couldn't pronounce Della More. A. Eh? Um, but Della Morte, Della More, that's kind of a rhyme. It's, yeah, it's there. If you're not going to buy the rhyme, that is that is the least stretch that this film is going to try and make you buy. But this film, uh, the title means of death, of love. That should tell you what you're going into in a movie like this. No, it doesn't tell you anything whatsoever. It tells you there are some goddamn Italians. That's right. What it tells you. Uh, this was part of the Facets Halloween stuff. So what happened, uh, Facets is a theater I probably talked about ad nauseum on the show. Uh, in Chicago, that did a big Halloween lineup. They were doing weekly film schools at Halloween. So the people who worked there uh, would all just pick a movie that they would show at the theater, and everybody was picking the zombie stuff and, you know, some classics, some good stuff there, but also a lot of what you would expect. So this presenter just thought they would give us the weirdest zombie movie they could find, and I think they kind of promoted it as a uh, sort of... um. Peter Jackson meets Shaun of the Dead, kind of buddy, cemetery, zombie stuff going on. Yeah, makes sense. And showed up for that, and you get some of that in the movie, in the beginning, and then it spirals into fucking insanity. It reminds me of Black Sabbath when we went to the music box, and I spiraled into insanity. right. That's what's actually happening in the film. It's like an inverse reaction. So part of the reason I wanted to do this on the show is uh, this is an experiment that you were not a willing participant of the experiment. Okay. But all I wanted to do was ask you, what dates would you say? You've seen, or you've seen some Italian cinema. You've seen some, um, I almost called them period pieces, but you know your eras of horror. So if you had to place this somewhere, you just watched this thing uh-huh. minutes ago, Where? what decade do you put this in? Or well, a year, if you could give me a more specific. Well, I want to see how close you can pin this down. All right, let's see. Okay, so I've seen I've seen Stage Fright. That sure. looks significantly older than this. Right. It's Stage Fright is uh, the same director. Okay, so that's Michelle Suave. I'm going to guess like uh, 93. That is incredibly accurate, my friend. The film is from 1994. Wow. All right, so the Stage Fright might be the cheat here. 
when I so another part of what happened at facets is before they would do the film schools before they would show the movies uh, often there was a little intro by the presenter. But before that, they had a bunch of old school exploitation trailers for stuff that was coming up. Mm -hmm. I believe it was the U.S. release that tried to package this in sort of a campy Evil Dead kind of way. Although it might have been the Italian trailer. But they showed this trailer and I said, oh, yeah, there is your late 70s exploitation. Spot on. And I was really surprised to learn that this film was made in 1994. Yeah, that I, I was guessing. I was trying to guess as as late as I could possibly stretch right. my imagination. Right. Well, you knew the Deliria thing. You yeah. Knew the the stage fright thing. Uh, but other than that, I thought this would be another good place to go with the exploration of Italian cinema because it's kind of a throwback movie. That yeah. was sort of the design of it. And as you know, we always come at these throwback movies being fans of the old stuff mm-hmm. and then looking at the new stuff and going, oh, how did that capitalize right, on that? Sure. What did it do? But what I've noticed in our conversations is those movies, when done well, are always the best pieces of the old stuff. Yeah. So I thought this would be a good way to take a crash course on Italian cinema because if you heard the last show, we clearly have no idea what the fuck we're talking about. Uh-huh. So maybe we could examine Cemetery Man and kind of go, okay, these are very obvious icons that it's pulling from other places Mm -hmm. kind of reverse engineer learning about italian films also interesting in 1994 this is still dubbed just once again reassuring i thought uh, when i started watching these movies that they dubbed up to a point and i'm finding that it's less popular recently but even in the last 10 years 15 16 years i mean they're still dubbing so we've seen a couple of these. What are you noticing about Italian horror? Well, the big ones for me is that they're strange. Yeah, um, that they <laughs> that they seems kind pretty of take place, universal. They kind of take place on a plane of reality that I'm not acquainted with. Maybe that's the Italian right. reality. Fuck if I know. I would say still uncomfortable with yeah, as well. I yeah, still watch these movies sure. and go, "Whoa, what are they yeah. doing? What's going on here?" They're joyfully violent. They yes. do not worry about being too violent, which I'm totally right. on board with. Obviously, and the other thing is that I can never tell whether they're being serious or not. I don't know if they're joking half the time because the gravity just suddenly shows up in scenes with characters. And sometimes it seems like certain characters are really serious while other characters are... Not so serious. ...face-fucking-severed heads. Yeah, or a character like Nagi who starts out as comic relief and starts to turn into a tragic character. Yeah. So he develops this love interest, then he loses the love interest in the same way, a similar way, I guess. <laughs> Nothing happens in the same way anywhere in Cemetery Man, but a similar way that the lead loses it. And when the lead loses his love interest, that's tragedy. Yeah. So when Nagi loses his love interest, that's sad too. And then the very end, I mean, I you know, this time around I kind of knew what was coming, although I don't remember this movie being nearly as weird the first time I saw it. But I still really felt for not. He's got the gun pointed at him, and it, you know it's as if he's been an unwilling participant in everything right. that's going on. You get the idea that maybe his uh, mental faculties perhaps aren't up to snuff. Yeah, right, right. So I mean, uh, parallels. I'm already looking at at uh, you know. I start right out looking at delirious stuff, the floorboards. I mean, just yeah. different director, almost cinematography stuff. I guess that's cinematography, right? Yeah, looking through sure. the floorboards. It's fancy camera work littered throughout the Italian movies as well. But they're also goddamn sexy, but in an Italian kind of weird way. Yeah. Where I don't, I guess. It's, it's, I'm aware that the movie is trying to be sexy, but it feels a little 80s and weird yeah. to me. Well, there were moments of, of I thought, so the, the scene, and I, I think you took it the wrong way, mm-hmm. but when they were making out with the cloths over their head, the one chick was in a burka and the other guy was a Ninja Turtle. Sure. And they were making out and, and I said... I think, what did I say? I said, that's weird. Uh huh. But I wasn't saying that's a strange thing to be seeing on screen. I was saying, that's weird. I have an erection. Oh, great. Because yeah, your you reaction. You failed to leave that part out, although I'm glad now that you did. Because your reaction when I said that's weird is, yeah, weird is one way of looking at it. And so I knew that you too were sharing in the erection that I was uh. having. However, the later stuff that goes on in the film that's supposed to be sexy, usually when giant areola chick has her shirt off. Right. I can't get on board with any of that for some reason. Is it the giant areola? Is no, it's not it that. Hmm. I don't have a bias toward areola size, but what okay. really got me is I think I hated that girl. 
<laughs> yeah. I just hated her so she much. She drives the confusion. It only gets worse well, as the movie yeah, goes I on. I mean, she the first time you see her, she's all burked out. And she's mourning over her dead old husband. And then she's all but masturbating in yeah. an underground cistern of skeletons. Sure. And ends up turning into poison ivy. Mm-hmm. And then ends up encouraging by, I guess, by not by her own fault but she ends up encouraging this guy to get a needle shoved up his urethra and right. his penis removed right and then finally the same girl albeit a different character i guess sort cheats of, him maybe. out of two hundred thousand lira by <laughs> fucking him is and it then lira or euros they say lira oh did they yeah. i thought it was euros no yeah i guess even back in 94 it wasn't euros right? yeah Although, who knows where this town yeah, is anyway? Yeah, and who knows what they're using. Right. They may be in the future. They may be... Who, I mean, so it's 1994 in the snow globe, but right. where is it outside, outside the, snow the snow globe? Oh, fucking snow globe. Don't even get me started on that. We'll, we'll get to that point. So, yeah, the comedy stuff, I totally follow you on that. I am uncertain of... I described that the first time I saw Stage Fright. Sure. I didn't know if I was supposed to be mocking it, if it had a sense of humor itself. Yeah. If it was... Even when we talked about it, we kind of talked about it as possibly being satirical, mm-hmm. but still we yeah. weren't sure. Well, there's a lot of... I I kept seeing, especially in all the cemetery shooting, mm-hmm. I saw so much Dead Alive in this movie. Yeah, yeah. And we did Dead Alive two... Th- well, we did it three years ago, right. but... Music it, Box It went up with Music yes. Box Massacre 4, and... I mean, I, I wish we could do it on the show. Maybe we'll get around. We've, yeah. We talk about bringing some of the old music box right, films right. back in full here. Maybe we'll just have to do Bad Taste or something. Just some, some old school Peter Jackson. Right. Because I think there's... I don't want to say that we should have done a double feature with this and right. Peter Jackson because it wouldn't have worked. Right. It would have been too much too of much. one <laughs> yes. thing and we probably would have lost each film inside sure. each other. Right. But there's so much of it there and I'm just so used to seeing that and laughing my ass off. And that, trying to latch onto it right, as exactly. the movie is doing all of this sure. crazy stuff. You go, oh, 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 Peter Jackson, I recognize yes. that. Let's stay with that for a second. But then immediately the film switches gears and it's a serious Italian drama. Right. And I'm wondering, wait, it was it not funny before? I'm confused. Was I sp- was I laughing right, at the wrong? Right. Was that not funny that her head was like off and he was making? I'm not sure where the jokes it's lie. One of those things that makes me wonder if the jokes that I think are jokes are actually symbolic or me. Okay, perfect example: the bus full of I guess Boy Scouts yeah. flies off the cliff. Right. So first of all, uh, before I get to the actual joke, they're also singing about how the Boy Scouts shouldn't have gone on the yeah, field trip or right. whatever at well, the funeral. Probably a joke. Live I and guess. learn. Um, but could be part of Italian love philosophy that is just pouring throughout the movie. But then also, right after the bus flies over the cliff, big traffic accident, people fucking heads run over, and like you said, the movie's not pulling any punches. The bus flies off the cliff, and in this moment of maybe great tragedy or hilarity, yeah. you get a reaction shot from a horse. <laughs> I mean, it just turned, what does the horse think of this yeah. event? Well, and the horse is like, whoa, look at that. It, and seems like, it seems like they go, well, we can't crash this bus. That's what you do when you can't afford to crash a bus. You can't afford the explosion. Maybe you don't have it in the budget. Maybe you don't want to show the carnage. Don't think you can do it justice. Instead, you show a reaction shot from a horse, and no one even asked to sure. see the crash. But because... You don't, after you see a horse's reaction to a crash, you don't care about the crash anymore. Dude, if a horse know why is upset at a horse, by a bus right? crash, can you imagine how bad it would be for a person to see that? Oh, terrifying. So maybe that's it. Maybe the crash was just so tragic that the Italians felt only a horse could convey the real suffering and pain. Well, that see, that's not too far off from a potential no, explanation. No, Look really at Dario not. Argento with sure. his psychic bugs. Right, right. Go back to our Italian. We did what? We did Stage Fright and Phenomena. Yes, right. We talked about Dario Argento and his his affinity for psychic insects. Right. But maybe it, uh, there's some but Italian... But he seems very serious right. about psychic well, insects. And that's the thing. Yeah. And maybe there's some Italian school that believes that horses have true emotions. Could be. Fuck if I know. Well, you also have all of these messages about love. It's almost, uh, I don't want to say it's almost poetic. Maybe I'll say it's almost poetry. How about that? There that means go. the same fucking thing, but sounds less like I know what sure. I'm talking about. Uh, especially the voiceover. The voiceover increasingly just sounds like macabre poetry. It almost sounds like Edgar Allan Poe. You know what I mean? Yeah. By the end of the movie, it's just pure poetry. The last stuff he's saying in the film, he's just reciting poems at that point. But even when he's explaining the rules, he's talking about how his love has come back. Is she back for you know, for real this time mm-hmm. or what's happening and questions that by the way are never answered. 
movie likes to invoke a lot of questions. For instance, is this happening all over the earth? Sure. Is this just in a select location? And basically says, fuck if I know, that's not important. Yeah. Moving right along. I'm pretty sure we're just going to have to go with the general thesis on this film is fuck if I know. Yeah, right. I think we've said it four times yes. already. Keeps getting weirder. Fuck if I know. So let's talk about this love thing for a second. Sure. I thought that that was one of the more interesting points raised by the film. (laughs) Right. If only because it was so dementedly dark. Yes. And then as soon as that darkness is raised, they just, they wisp it away (laughs) in a nice sunny breeze. Yep. Nagi's all into the, the chick that's... He pukes on, the chick he pukes on. So already kind of fucked up. Yeah. Pukes on her, she's underage, there's a consensual thing about... Well, you can force it upon me. Maybe it won't be forced. Yeah. <laughs> Let's find out. So, I'm just a severed head. Right. Well, see, that's the thing is Francesco says when Nagi pukes on her and runs away, he says something along the lines of, oh, you know, they all end up here sooner or later. Yeah, mostly. Right. So he's basically saying, oh, don't worry. You'll get to have your way with her once she's dead and she'll <laughs> sure. probably die sooner than later. Well, he had his own dead girlfriend on his mind, I guess. Exactly. So then she dies in this horrendous bus crash where heads are squashed and motorcycles fuse to men's body. Right. right. And then immediately that's just yay. Yay for Nagi. The girl's <laughs> yeah. in the grave. It's not, it's not. He's really happy about it. It's not this dark he was right. She was gonna yeah. die. Yeah. Maybe there's some gravity. It's immediately, it immediately brushes off. Yeah, mass of people died and instead goes to hooray for Nagi. He's finally united with his right, love's right. head. That's part of the aspect of the film that I really liked is its ability to say something horrendously dark. And we'll get into this with Adam's family, too. Yeah, yeah. But it says something horrendously dark. And instead of bringing that to fruition in the typical, this is a dark horror movie. Right. Look at the fear unfold in these yeah. horrendous events. It just says something dark. And while you're kind of chewing it over in your head, you forget that that's the implication and you immediately sure. move on to hooray my characters are having a good love life right yeah movies having a good time now i guess it's i guess there's no time for mourning just have to move on but i mean that's not the end of it things just keep getting weirder and weirder i mean so there's also you know when you said you thought the love stuff was kind of interesting you meant the treatment of it right i also think it's part of if you're going to look at the mythology of the movie they basically say oh yeah zombies cemetery man's got to you know kill the zombies For as much as this pulls from, let's say, the Argento stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, the Italian horror stuff, as much as it's a callback to a lot of that, it's also got a really original story. You know, we we talked about it borrowing from some of the sort of Peter Jackson Mm -hmm. camp of stuff. But then this guy is all right. So if you're going to look at this from high concept, because it does that for a little while, here is Cemetery Man. And yeah, you blame the U.S. release for giving him that title. But I'm going to, you know, take what they give me. Cemetery Man. He takes care of the cemeteries, the titular character. Sure. He tells us right in the beginning. He knows and, the score. Yeah, he knows the score, right. So the the exploitation trailer was just a hardcore voiceover over the opening scene when he's wrapped in a towel on the phone. Oh, hold on, answers the door, shoots the guy with the briefcase, goes back to the phone, and then it's like, cemetery man. So I think I know what I'm getting into, and the film plays around with that for a while. But uh, then he kills the woman, and he accidentally kills the woman, right. which is the part that's a little fucked up. It's already sad, oh, boo-hoo, she died. But then you find out that he killed her. And that actually does feel, like, pretty fucked up. Yeah. You know, you think, oh, you made a mistake, essentially. You're so used to just killing human beings left and right. That's what your life has become. Playing around in the phone book, killing human beings left and right, that you just shot her dead. Anytime someone makes a, makes a bad move, you just shoot them dead. And we get the rules, and all that stuff feels interesting and pretty fresh for something that's high concept. I mean, what, it's... uh. You know, it, they have seven days. That's a, it sounds like a strict rule, but we find out the seven days yeah. are flexible. Um, a bite doesn't kill, and that becomes important in the reveal of I accidentally killed her. Uh, he hands that line to us as if we're all idiots for not right. understanding. Because he says it to Nagi, a stupid Nagi. You know, a, you know a bite doesn't kill. Right. And I thought, all right, so this is a little weird. We're running in the originality direction as far as... How, it's original in the way that something like Phone Booth is original. Uh-huh. You know, it's, we had a great idea in the writer's room. Now we're going to flesh it out, look how original it is. But then it just... The thing that makes it bizarre is the reoccurring love interest. Uh, I think she's credited as she... So she comes back over and over in these different forms. We never know, even after the stupid snow globe twist thing at the end, that does not help us understand 
why she comes back. Yeah, or whether it's him seeing multiple people. Sure. Because, so, I, originally my brain goes to, okay, dude's a little fucked up. Right. He's starting to see his ideal girl in sure. all these other women. But then there's the, okay, so, twofold. The second incarnation of she, if that is the name. One, she says, I feel like I've known you forever and I've loved you forever. Right. And little little side note, this is not part of my point, but... What the fuck? She makes him get a shot up his fucking cock. I'm going to completely disagree with you. I'm going to say what the fuck on his part. She was like, I have a phobia of penises. That's true. And he was like, great, I'll run off. To okay. The-. He doesn't go, wait, 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 we can work through yeah. your fear. He goes, stay right here. I'm going to get my Johnson cut off. And so immediately that brings me to point number two, the other option. So the options apparently to be with this woman. Okay. Imagine you, Eric Ingram. And this is a very difficult thought experiment for you. Oh, I great. know. Imagine there is the perfect woman for you, and she comes up to you and says she has a fear of penises. You have two options. <laughs> One, get your penis removed. Two, rape her. <laughs> <laughs> is that? Well, in the context of the Italian film, though, we find out that rape turns out not such a well, big see, deal. Well, see, that's what ever. I wanted to bring up. Is <laughs> right. That is one of the strangest treatments of rape I have yeah. ever seen in a film. Sure. He raped me. And the guy immediately gets pissed off. Right. You know, cemetery man is ready to take action. She goes, yeah. no, no, no. It's okay. It wasn't so bad. Little fountainhead going on it there. Was, it, it was hard at first. Yeah. When, the violent stuff, but then it was nice. And, and then we kind of did it again as an right. apology. As an apology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, after, you know, the weird severed head stuff that we talked about. Like how the severed head is the introduction to uh, forced romanticism in right. the film. And then it just becomes the mayor raped me and I liked it. And then she comes back as another incarnation. So we've covered incarnation number one, where she's naked Poison and Ivy. having sex in the graveyard. But that's like incarnation number one B, because then she's sure. dead. Okay. So it's it's regular she, and then she after she's shot, uh, and then you know coming back, and then there's Mayor's receptionist, and then there's she, hooker college girl. the college hooker apparently. So at that point he's pissed. He burns it all to the ground. Brings it all down. And then, uh, th- uh, meanwhile, of course, there's a gumshoe hot on his case, but helping him for some yeah. reason. Never Comes explained and goes. why. Comes uh, and just goes. A, a weird, surreal I think dream it's just, snow globe I think thing. It's, it's kind of, well, yeah, I think part of it is is kind of that there are only a limited number of people in this snow that globe. That could be a sure snow globe. But right. um, I think the other thing is that this guy is kind of, I think he's there to prove that the law isn't just letting this go. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Right. It's it, cuz if to okay, so imagine imagine there were no detective, you would say something like, "What are the police doing about this madman?" Yeah, but if right, there's a right. cop and he's helping him out, you instead of going, "I wonder why he's helping him out," you just kind of, yeah, you take well, care at of least the more there's pressing a cop. Issue. Sure. <laughs> that adds to the mystery of the film when you go, "Why isn't you know, why is he helping him?" But if the law just didn't say anything, you would think, "Oh, the movie wants me to overlook that." Exactly. We haven't even covered the weird impotence uh, yeah. subplot, which I don't think we can cover, He's right? He's impotent, I, but then he has a no penis, but then he has a penis and it right. works, doesn't work. I don't know. Because don't, his medication isn't working. I don't understand. Yeah, I guess. I don't medication know. was a placebo. I guess. Solved. Done and done. So then there is the snow globe ending. Uh, I thought we were going to try and maybe divorce ourselves from that because I just tried to forget about that. We when should I left mention the theater. it, I think. But um, you know, well, we've talked about it a little bit. Yeah, I I think maybe it explains some of the stuff in a weird way. Yeah, well, um, it explains why the snow looks funny, why the snow falls at a different frame rate than the movie right. uh, is filmed. You get a little foreshadowing of this on the phone. I don't know if you caught that. Where, because I know sometimes you're very suspicious that movies are going to do weird things, and I told you the movie was going to get weirder. So I thought you might be looking for a weird fight club kind of thing going on. I was. Together pieces. That's the first thing I go for. Yeah. So there's a conversation with Mystery Man on the phone who he later discovers but never gets a reason out of. Uh, I think that's the guy he's Franco, talking right. to. And uh, he talks about, well, what if there is nothing else? I've never been outside of the town. What if we're all that's here? Foreshadowing that eventually they will be in a snow globe. Now, I don't know. The end shot of the snow globe is brief. So this tells us a couple things. Tells us it's not just stylistic, right? Because if they wanted to show a spinning snow globe at the end, like the God Delusion showed a spinning bobblehead, Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't part of the message of the film. That was just a spinning bobblehead. Although I think that said something about icons and there was a teapot in there somewhere, but that's far beyond the point. This wasn't just, I'm going to put a snow globe in the end credits. Sure, They showed it briefly, meaning that it's part of the film. You know what I mean? Like, Like they wanted to tell us, hey, here's the ending twist thing, and then it faded out, and then there was just regular credits. 
However, what was in the snow globe was, first of all, did not resemble the town. It just resembled mm-hmm. the cliff, the edge of the cliff. And it was clearly the two characters, but incredibly poor. Uh, right. It just wasn't very realistic. So is that budgetary constraints, bad prop job, or is the snow globe purely symbolic? Or what does it mean, Michael? What does it mean? Uh, fuck if I know. Uh, let's talk about the Adams family. Okay. So the Adams family, it's a Barry Sonnenfeld film. It's his first direct, it's his directorial debut. Sure, sure. Ooh, look at us using film words. So Adams family is the film version of a TV show that aired way, way, way back in right. the, in the land of black and white before either of us were born. Exactly. I've seen it. I love it. It's great. We're not talking about it. We're going to talk about the Barry Sonnenfeld, the first film of the Adams family films, but the Christopher Lloyd, right? Uh, the second one had Christopher Lloyd as well. Didn't yeah. It? Well, the, the first two films, okay. Are the of same the cast. Christopher Lloyd, right? Yeah. Right. Of that. I'm just trying to troop. pick an actor. Sure. Angelica sure. Houston, Christina Ricci, the troupe right. that most, I guess most people probably attribute uh, if the films to. Yeah. Anyway. Right. Maybe we'll talk about the TV. Uh, if we can do like the Munsters movie and cause they have a movie, right? There's oh a yeah. Monsters oh, film. there is. And then, uh, like Elvira, maybe we'll Elvira, do some Elvira. That seems like a Elvira, campy TV. Vampira, different, someone hot. That's different eras though, right? The Munsters oh, yeah. and Elvira are seriously different. We're talking oh, yeah. about sixties uh, sure. versus eighties, something think, like that. Yeah, that's about right. I could be terribly wrong. This is why we're not doing the TV stuff right now. Maybe we'll get to that later. Uh, but let's just focus on this film. All right, Barry Sonnenfeld, he, so other films he's directed, that's kind of what we do is we say what they've directed. Sure. So he did the Men in Black movies. Yeah. But he also, he's been all over yeah, double feature. Yeah. Uh, he was a cinematographer for the Coen brothers for a long right? time. He did that. Uh, Misery cinematographer mm-hmm. for Misery. Did a lot of cinematography before doing The Addams Family. Right. And, and then also executive produced The Tick. There we go. Both the the live action version. Absolutely. Yeah, love and, it. And uh, Get Shorty as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, all over the board, this guy. But The Adams Family, directorial debut, fantastic directorial yeah, debut. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So essentially, this version of The Adams Family is so far separate from the original one, color. Yeah. First time The Adams Family has really been seen in color. Sure. There were cartoons and toys and shit. Color. I don't think anyone's going to hold the toys against the film for the Dude, first time in have color. have you ever gotten emails from these people? I have, actually. But the other thing is that the films, the 90s Adams Family films, are so much darker. And I don't mean in color. I mean the brand of film. Yeah, it was black comedy before the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Well, yeah, exactly. It's There's some lines. There are things that happen. And the best part is that they're not plot points. The plot points of the film are pretty normal. Right. With various, ex- I mean, Adam's family normal. Okay. So we should talk about Adam's family normal. Yes, that's a really good point. Before we go into stuff, because uh, I remember, you know, when I saw the movie when I was younger, having a real hard time pinning down what exactly was off about the Adams family. They're not crooks, right? Mm-hmm. They're not they're, mean. They're, they don't commit crimes. They're not mean. I don't think they even have, uh, you know, any ill intentions. They're just bizarre. They're weird. I mean, okay, so without, I'm not going to go ahead and quote it, but it's the introductory theme. Yes, it's right. the theme. That's what's weird about them. Sure, is they're just weirdos, and they're dark, and there's a gothic thing about them. Right, and but they're totally safe. Yeah, which is why the Adams family's great. Sure, people are uncomfortable with them. People try to take advantage of them. They're kind of simple. They're terrifying to be around, but they will not hurt you. Right, right. Yeah, in this movie, I mean, the lawyer and company, those are the bad people. Sure. They are the bad guys in the film. And they're taking advantage of, I mean, you know, I, I want to walk back a little bit from calling them simple, but I guess I would agree with that. I think they just, they have, uh, they're sort of naive. Mm-hmm. They don't think there's evil in the world. They're, um, they're interested in the evils of the world, but maybe they don't see that in their well, neighbors. See, that's the thing is, is the beauty of the Adams family is to kind of do this thing. This film calls out that there are evil and I'm saying evil in big quotes. There are, there's cemetery man evil. Mm-hmm. There are zombies and, and witches and the Bermuda triangle right. and shrunken heads and <clears throat> uh, Bermuda triangle. That is total bullshit. But continue. And all these, all these, you know, the, the typical, you know, your checklist top 10 horror movie subjects. Okay. All right. These are things that they're comfortable with. They hang out with their friends are all versions of those things. Yeah, right. Siamese twins, hunchbacks, cyclopses. Sure. They're all there. Cousin it. Great example. Right. Right. Weird shit. 
the things that makes them uncomfortable, politicians, yeah. news reporters, right. pastel colors, <laughs> yeah. the, the stuff that, the stuff that kind of falls under the working class zombie right. of, of discomfort. They're uncomfortable with middle America. Yeah. Well, the point where they have to go get jobs is a perfect example. You know, they're, uh, the woman is talking to Morticia about how, oh, is your husband uh, basically a lazy oaf, yeah. right? Does he just lay around and dream all day? A shiftless dreamer. Yeah, to which she responds. Not anymore. Yeah. As if to say, look, it's fine to have fucking dreams. Back off, you fucking nine to five asshole. <laughs> but I feel like it's kind of John Waters that way. Yeah. It's kind of saying, I mean, maybe even a more extreme version of that. John Waters is about what's real and out there, and it's still okay. You know, sexual fetishes. Sure. Definitely out there, definitely exist, A-OK. Uh, something we talked about, especially a dirty shame. A dirty shame is all about, hey, this is the bear community, and these people are into this weird thing, and look, everything is all right there. Even when we talked about polyester, it got weirder, but it was still about, I mean, those were the early days of just projecting the weirdness onto suburbia and seeing what happens, performing that experiment, I guess. Mm -hmm. The Adams Family is even darker it is, here are people who are interested in serial killers and murder and bad things that happen in the world, but they themselves are not bad. Right. How will their neighbors react to that? Exactly. How does the community react to sure. that? Sure. And the community, I guess in that kind of way, and maybe this is where the success of the TV show came from, aside from just being an oddity at the time that it was on, it was just, you know, the thing we see about all antiheroes, the thing where there's a little dark part of them that we kind of identify with. You know, the bad day part of us right. where we go, I have this thing that no one understands. I have a love of this particular film. Nobody gets it. I get made fun of for this or this or this. That's the Adams family. Right. They're the people who love all of those things. Exactly. And no one understands sure. them for that. And they go head to head with those people. They don't back down from that at all. They treat the outsiders as if they're the people doing the weird thing. The mundane is what's right. weird to them. I think the score is one of the things that pulls back from the dark, uh, makes it not a dark tone. Sure. I think most of the darkness is in writing. We'll get mm -hmm. to that. Uh, but everything else about the movie is trying to treat that as if it's light. Um, it's Mark Shaman who does the music for this. We've seen his stuff before on the show, or heard his stuff, I guess, uh, when we did Team America, World okay. Police, right, when right. we did South Park, uh, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. He actually, the Mr. Hankey episode of South Park, the Christmas classic, it's, uh -huh. a, you know, it's a musical Christmas music video montage thing that South Park did. I want to say in the third season or something. So he wrote that with them, and his music was used in a, another episode too. But he shows up just as often as Barry Sonnenfeld does. So that's part of the lightness. I think most of it comes from the actors treating things oh, as if yeah. they're normal. Sure. The first is Christopher Lloyd. That's yeah. the the top guy you have to talk about because man, what a where did that guy go? By the way, yeah, uh, just so many movies during that. Really, we saw him on the show in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yep, uh, he obviously Back to the sure. Future. He shows up on the fucking Sci Fi Channel all the time. He was in the um, he was in one of the Star Trek films. Christopher Lloyd seems like a guy who is just Doc Brown, and then you notice him show up everywhere. For a five or ten year period, mm -hmm. I guess. So the two other major players for me, I think, are Gomez and Morticia. Yeah, they right. fucking own this film. Yeah. So Raul Julia plays Gomez, uh -huh. uh, who is since he's dead now. That's sad times. And Angelica Houston plays Morticia. Yeah. And Angelica Houston, I don't know how old she is in this film. I know she's older now, and she's a Wes Anderson actor. And I'm, she is so hot. In I'm glad movie. you said that. I really, I really am glad. Not because I believe she is as hot as you believe, although there is that Elvira that yeah. part of me that that appeals to. Uh, but because I think that this is so, this is infinitely worse than what you said, and also infinitely more appropriate if you actually think about it. I'm going to try and save myself from this. I think Christina Ricci is one of the hottest people on the planet. So Christina Ricci is about eight in this film. I don't know how old she actually is. It's, um, she did a couple movies before this, but this uh -huh. was where people, Wednesday Adams. Oh yeah. That was sure. Christina Ricci and, um, eventually managed to do the thing that very few child actors do and transition into adult. She's actually had a pretty lucrative career. Oh yeah. She's all um, over. Done more adult films now than she did as a child actor. And by adult films, you mean films as an adult. See, it's already Don't getting get everybody weird, excited. Isn't it? isn't it? 
But God, Christina Ricci, first of all, I mean, was my first love when I was young and watched this film. Wednesday Adams was just, and she gives such a great performance. Oh yeah, she's amazing. She's fucking phenomenal. Uh, just her reactions, I mean, in the appropriate points, she can be completely dulcet, but that's not, you know, sometimes you just get a, a kid that stares off into space mm-hmm. and that's all that's required of them. But there are particular points where she also has to show an extreme amount of joy or amusement at something. And she just, to see her eyes light up like that, it's just an awesome performance. And then also when the kids are um, doing their stage show, right. when they're giving right. the little, I don't even know what that it's is. A Shakespearean, it's, it's yeah, a Shakespearean right, right. thing. And she has to actually deliver a performance on stage. And you can tell that there's something different, I guess in the performance of both of the kids, that there's something different, even though they're just playing and amusing themselves, there is something that makes that different from when they're at home they are putting on a performance Mm -hmm. for other people and it's not reactions they're going for but they know you know that the whole scene could have been done as if it was just them in the living room sword fighting again but it wasn't done that way it was done in a way where we're doing something repulsive and shocking and there's an audience in front and then it ends with the family getting up and applauding yeah right and 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 gomez saying brava brava which is one of the most egregious things except it's fantastic because there you have this high class family sure in the middle of again these these general suburban families and generic people that's how the film paints them and it's just really funny to watch them kind of get this darkness right that it's weird being you know you're watching the film as one of the normal people but you're on the adams family side yeah for sure for sure and throughout the film they certain things happen that the family specifically will say or be doing. And and I mean, you can attest to this. I was sitting there and things would happen. I would turn to you. I'd be like, that is not an okay thing. Oh, stuff that is just just so messed up. Right. Stuff like the, I mean, something so simple as the grandma clubbing a dog for dinner. Yep. That wouldn't be normal. That would make people uncomfortable in the film today unless you treated it right. One of the really strong ones is uh, when Wednesday wants to play the game with Pugsley. So I won't go too much into my love of Christina Ricci just because it's weird when she's Wednesday. If we get something on the show where she's actually my age, then I can talk about it. But I mean, she's someone who owns a production company, which is just ridiculously cool. I love to see people in uh, producing aspects of a film or helping get films that they really want to do made. Uh, Something like Prozac Nation, which had a hard time for fucking ever getting made. And it's pretty much because of her that it at least got distribution, if not made. But so there's the production company thing that's cool. A lot of the film roles are cool. There was a John Waters thing she did, which was pretty hip. She's on the board at Planned Parenthood. I mean, I just can't get enough of Christina Ricci. Awesome. So hopefully we'll get to her on a later show. But she carries a lot of the, especially in the beginning, Yeah. the more messed up stuff. Sure. I mean, there's, there's the obvious stuff in the beginning. But then there's also, uh, as the film goes on... Let's play Is There a God? Right. Where things, again, that's dangerous. That's inflicting pain. A lot of times we're even talking about torture. Sure. But always on willing participants. Right. Well, and Never never right. on someone who doesn't ask for it. And the reason that I really like the specifically the Is There a God scene is the film gives itself an out. Yeah. A lesser film would go have Morticia come upstairs, say, we need to leave. I said no. And then the kids would sulk down the stairs. Yeah. But she says just a little, and sure. Morticia's just as into it as as Wednesday. Morticia right, was a young right. girl too, <laughs> sure. at at one point. So she says okay, but just for a little bit, and then Pugsley gets electrocuted, and Wednesday's face just lights up with right. joy watching her brother probably get killed. You I just mean, use electrocuted and lights up. I want you to be aware of that. I'm sorry. Yeah, the other way they have an out is just in how they show that scene. How about this? I'll do you one better in the execution of that scene. They move away and look at some other stuff. I mean, it's uh, let's play as there no God, you know, maybe throw a switch or whatever. I don't remember the exact moment they cut away. But then the movie does something else just momentarily and then comes back to the kids playing as if uh, that was that was kind of the out. We're going to go, oh, we know it's coming up. Isn't that going to be fucked up? And then not think about it. But we do come back. We do see it happen. Something the film, by all means, doesn't have to do. And what makes that even worse is all of these lines are coming from the kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not one to stand up and go, what about the children? Think of the children. But I know that pushes people's buttons. They're the kids saying this stuff. That just makes it infinitely more fucked up. 
Uh, you mentioned Morticia. She has her moments, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, where she's taking uh, Uncle Fester. Um, I was trying to create a hybrid of the words Fester and imposter, and it just didn't happen. I failed everyone. I'm sorry. But she's taking uh, taking him out there and just showing him all of the messed up ways people died. Sure. Uh, you know, it's on it's on the, uh, not the gravestones, but I guess the statues yeah. that are built. Right. But, I don't care about yeah. after I die, so uh-huh. I know nothing about that. I know that the entire death industry is a big sham. Uh-huh. They charge way too much money and take advantage of the living. Beyond that, I know nothing. The statues, whatever the yeah. fuck they're called. I'm sure they have a fancy mortician, pay $900,000 for the statue name. And they're all, oh, this was this person. They got sure. shot three times here. Right. This is this person. Well, where she talks about uh, later or earlier, maybe, uh, where she talks about <laughs> one of their family members being burned alive. Right. Well, and I think my favorite of all of those is the uh, when they're talking about her parents, right? They're talking about the grandparents, and they say something like, uh, I wish the children could have known them. Tell that to an angry mob. Yeah, And right. then you just hear a roaring mob Sounds in the background. Sounds like angry mob, sure. I just love the notion that the, for all the people that angry mobs have, have run out of town and strung up, their grandkids never got to meet them. Oh, what a shame. And she also has the moment, uh, you know, when they're out job hunting, where she makes all of the children cry, which is, an, right. again, the film exploiting children sure. to portray sadness or to well, portray she asks, she asks kids flat out, how do you think it would be? Feel, right. How do you think it would feel to be burned right. alive? I think put the tortoise on the highway. That's also, a really good one, too. <laughs> that's put the tortoise on the highway one. during rush hour. Yeah, right. But that always cracks me up because I remember Christina Ricci getting a bunch of shit from PETA. And man, we're just hitting all the bullshit in this episode. But another fucked up organization that cares about pets more than people and is just so ass backwards. But uh, yeah, during their big stupid no fur campaign, you know, sending Christina Ricci angry letters. And then I see the Adams family put the tortoise on the highway and it brings a little bit of joy back into my heart. I think that's all part of the movie wanting to fuck with you. I mean, the movie does stuff that's not even dark. It just messes with. Right. There's a, a scene where he's, he's downstairs playing with the trains. Right. And we yes. get a, a point of view shot from inside the train. I guess that's where a point of view shot would come from in there. Redundant. Anyways, uh, with a man sitting inside, you know, reading a paper or looking around or whatever. Why the fuck is there a man inside the train? How does that even make any sense? I just, there's no reason. And they never come back sure. to it. Well, it doesn't make what, any sense. Never revisit it. That's one of the strangest things about the film is I, people say, I want to watch The Addams Family. And in my head, I go, that film is based in my universe it's just a bunch of weirdos that sure. live somewhere that I don't live, but you right. know, it's just the normal universe. And I watch the film. The gate is anthropomorphized. The rug is anthropomorphized. Yeah. There's a walking hand. Right. There's all this right. stuff that's beyond supernatural. Right. You have the books that shoot lightning. All this stuff. And for some reason, I go, well, but okay. So, but that's the Adams family's house. Yeah. Right. So somehow it's natural. It's not. It's not. We're not pushing the boundaries of science here. There's no right. spiritual bullshit. It's just, come on, Adam's family. It's we their all house. stay in one place. They yeah. have a weird house, so the gate moves, but it's not really alive. There's an explanation somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's Someone has there. an explanation, sure. but that person is too busy fencing. And what's more, that supernatural, that borderline supernatural stuff, although even when you're looking at the gate in the beginning, I mean, it's not like it moves super crazy or anything. Um, all of that stuff is just more... Look, even our gate is weird. Our gate is not like your gate. Don't pretend to understand our gate. You know what? Your gate doesn't open on its own. Fuck you. Our gate does. One of the things that's always so weird when I watch this, not the actual weird stuff, which uh-huh. is completely normal apparently, but that's uh, really weird, is this fester imposter thing. Right. I have a hard time gripping onto what's happening here. So as I watch the movie, I get a feeling that although he's clearly the imposter, you saw him with hair. He talks to his mom about how it's actually his mom who's been raising him his whole uh-huh. life. And as stuff goes on, I start thinking, are they really not going to put real Uncle Fester in this movie? Because that would be weird. And then he starts hitting these different points, you know, with Gomez, with different people, with the kids, where he really gets into what they're doing. I mean, that becomes a plot element. Sure. That's something that mother doesn't like. And, uh, you know, he's going to the party. He's having a good playtime with the conjoined twins. Uh, he's becoming... Uncle Fester. So was he Uncle Fester? What happened? Yeah. There? So Bermuda Triangle, something happened. At the very end of the film, there's kind of, there's some quick whatever devices. Yeah. Where they go, 
Oh yeah, isn't it weird that Doctor Pendersloss kind of just found him? Yeah, in the from the Bermuda Triangle, but it was actually Uncle Fester, but he had amnesia. Yeah, and then they brought him back, and so it's actually been Uncle Fester the whole time. Well, crazy! <laughs> and then everyone goes, "Yay!" And the film ends. So this is one other thing. This is a minor thing. So please feel free if you're not an avid listener of Double Feature, just chapter right on. Yeah, but we did a film a while ago called Hatchet, and sure. anybody who's a familiar long while with the ago. show. It's episode that, number four, I think. Yeah, but it's still ago. one of the greatest films we've done on this show. Sure, Hatch I and mean, Memento. That was the fourth sure. episode. And we do we call we say old school American horror all the time. Right, it's a hatchet thing. So if you'll remember in Hatchet, there were two chicks that consistently would take their shirts off and woo the camera. And there's a blonde chick and a brunette chick. Right, the little Girl Scout in the Adams Family movie oh. is the blonde girl. From Hatchet. Are they made from real Girl Scouts? Exactly. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. You might have told me that at the time. And uh, that goes into weird Christina Ricci yep. territory, doesn't it? I have seen both of those girls topless from Hatchet and Christina Ricci as well. This is all sorts of weird. There was a period in the 90s where you were getting a lot of this dark stuff. It was almost, it was almost trendy in the way that indie films are yeah. trendy now. And it was a brief period, and that was, I guess, kind of my childhood or something, sure. early fucking adulthood or whatever. But I wonder if that stuff will ever make a con- – because there's no resurgence of that at all, yeah. right? Nobody's even made – a film like The Addams Family, nowhere in existence, yep, this, this version of The Addams Family. I just kind of want it to come back. All right, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, you can click on our little iTunes thing there. We could use some iTunes reviews. Feel free to give us an absolutely honest review, even if it isn't five stars. We just like having the feedback on there. Um, if you want to give us some detailed feedback, pleasant or otherwise, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And then also we could use some donations, donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Great. All right, so I promised things would get weird again. We, oh, yeah. We settled down the weird after, uh, let's see if I can do it one more time, Delamorte, Delamore. Yeah. But it's going to get weird again. What are we doing next time? Next time we're doing, I don't even know where this Let, pair came from. Let's start with saying the McVeigh tapes. We're doing the Maybe McVeigh tapes next that'll time. That'll help. So that's a documentary aired on MSNBC, and you're going to have to pirate that shit. I don't know where you get it. We tried to get it off MSNBC's website. We watched website. it on YouTube. We, yeah, YouTube, yes. Uh, yeah, I remember that last second youtube itch. Yeah, so I don't know. Look, look on some torrent sites or find it on YouTube or whatever. I don't think anyone cares. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a documentary. Now, you can't put that with anything, right? It's yeah, about there's, no, there's no way to pair there's up no good pair the there. Oklahoma That's City not. bombing with anything. So we just decided to put it with that movie where Crispin Glover talks to a wombat. It's called Willard. <laughs> yes. And it's a really good time. Because if there's one thing the show doesn't have enough of, it's wombats. That's right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.